Welcome everybody. My name is Rahul. Uh, it's my honor to be hosting this excellent panel discussion. Uh, it's been more than two months since the invasion of Ukraine began on 24th of February 2022 at 5 a.m. And what I understand that Europe will always be before and after since that date. Today we have a very esteemed panel with us, starting with the Madam Ambassador. Let me read out her bio so that uh, people are more aware of her excellent work. So Madam Katrina Zelenko is the ambassador of Ukraine to Singapore. She's a career diplomat. She was appointed the ambassador of Ukraine to Singapore in November, 2020. Prior to her coming to Singapore, she served as the spokesperson of Ukraine in the foreign ministry and was the deputy director of communications and public diplomacy department. Her postings abroad include Ukraine Embassy in the Republic of Austria, permanent mission of Ukraine in Vienna. And later she was also ambassador. She was also in Germany where she was covering culture, press and public diplomacy. In 2018, she returned to Kyiv to work in the political department of Ukrainian foreign ministry. Her appointment as Ukraine's, where she was appointed as Ukraine's chief spokesperson in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Madam Katrina Zelenko has master's degree in international relations and foreign policy at the Institute of International Relations of Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Madam Katrina Zelenko for coming for this session. It's an honor and pleasure to have you. Good evening, thank you for having me. Next on our panel, we have Dr. Galina Kogut. Dr. Galina Kogut is a researcher with National Institute of Education and has a PhD from NTU in Singapore. She's born in Ukraine and has widely researched and taught Eastern philosophy and Western psychology. She is the president of Ukrainian club in Singapore and is the founder of Ukrainian language school in Singapore. Her research focuses on pedagogy with specific emphasis on language acquisition, cross-cultural understanding and dialogic teaching. She has translated various Asian scriptures into Eastern European languages and authored books such as Dig Digital Storytelling for Educated Purposes and An Atheist Gets the Gita. Dr. Galina Kogut, it's an honor and pleasure to have you on board. Thank you so much for joining this session. And finally, we have Ben William from Red Cross. Ben started his career with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where he was uh, from 1981 to 2018. Besides senior position at Ministry of Foreign Affairs headquarters, he also served in several Singapore embassies abroad, including Brunei, Philippines, USA, and Laos. He was Singapore's ambassador to Laos from 2007 to 2011. In April 2011, Benjamin joined the Singapore Red Cross, commonly known as SRC, and took over as the general secretary and the chief executive officer of the Singapore Red Cross in March 2012. As a part of his portfolio, he sees all humanitarian works of Singaporean Red Cross, both local and overseas, including disaster response and recovery mission. Under his leadership, the Singapore Red Cross has grown its suite of humanitarian services to serve the vulnerable in Singapore, including the elderly and the disabled, particularly so given the rapidly aging population of Singapore. Singapore Red Cross has made significant pro progress in enhancing its overseas disaster response capabilities so as to enable the Singapore Red Cross to respond to major disasters and crises abroad within, 24, within 48 hours. Singapore Red Cross has seen its role as a thought leader in the field of humanitarian work and grown significantly. But thank you so much, Benjamin, for joining this session. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. Yeah. So we have quite a few audience already in the panel. So I would just, uh, sorry, in, in the audience, I would just like to say that uh, we have some ground rules. So I will be asking some leading questions and post that we will open the floor to audience. So if you have a question, you can type the question in the chat box and you can also raise your hand. So we'll give priority to people who are wanting to question or wanting to ask question in person. So you can raise your hand, I'll come to you and I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. During the session, please try to keep your uh, computers on mute so that there is no disturbance. And with that, without further ado, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, my first question to you. So although we have been seeing the situation which is there in Ukraine through various news channels, through social media, maybe we should hear it from you. What is the situation like in Ukraine now as we speak? Thank you. 
Uh, I'm sure you all will follow the news and um, can um, definitely see that um, my country is uh, in the war now. I think it's also important to stress on the appropriate wording. This is war. It's not just a crisis, uh, not, of course, a military operation, as we hear from the Russian outlets and from the Kremlin. This is a large scale war which started as an attack from different directions. Uh, was a uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and um, Russia continued its deliberate attacks in different regions. We all saw that um, the Kremlin could not reach its um, goal, which was actually to achieve um, Blitzkrieg within three days to uh, conquer the whole territory of Ukraine and to achieve the regime change. It did not happen thanks to the strong resilience and resistance within the Ukrainian society, um, thanks to the strength of our army, and of course, thanks to the support which we got from our partners from around the world, uh, military, uh, political, economic, in many spheres. Yes, the security situation remains very tense, uh, we see that after Russia failed to achieve progress on the ground, it started indiscriminate shellings and attacks in the residential areas of many cities. Um, uh, we all have seen uh, and heard the terrible news about the recent, re recent um, attacks and shellings in the city of Odessa, but um, the most uh, difficult situation still remains in the city of Mariupol, which has been besieged and um, Every day, um, thousands of people remain in uh, on the territory of the um, steel plant Azovstal, which is uh, under shellings, under bombardments. Um, there are th hundreds of um, injured people, um, civilians and military. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, all uh, our attempts and all talks aimed at um, providing a humanitarian corridor for those people um, remained uh, without a result. That is what we have now. This is the sad reality which we have. But the good news is that we see that there are more and more um, countries who um, realized that the war in Ukraine, it's not only about Ukraine. This is the situation which um, is already having and will definitely uh, in the coming months have um, significant implications on many regions uh, across the globe. In, um, many societies, especially the fragile ones, um, start feeling it already, as we know that Ukraine is one of uh, the major um, uh, producers and exporters of essential food products globally. Uh, and uh, of course, it's all about the global security. Nothing to say about the violation of the norms and principles of the international law and the rules-based order, which lie at the core of uh, every civilized society. This is something we Ukrainians are fighting for. We are fighting for our freedom, for our independence, and for the free choice of um, the new generations of Ukrainians to come. Um, that is why it is important to um, get more support from the global community. I think we will be able to speak in detail about it. Thank you. Sure. sure. So let me pick up from what you just mentioned, support from the international global community. So uh, we have seen uh, quite a lot of support, both humanitarian as well as military that has come in the past. And yet we are still uh, on, in the third uh, month of the war. So uh, the question remains, uh, what kind of support would Ukraine need at this point in time from international communities so that they can uh, champion the cause that they are fighting for? Well, we need to be um, clear about the fact that Ukraine is uh, fighting against uh, quite a formidable army, which is though poorly led. So you see that Russia has already lost more than 22,000 soldiers in this war. Yeah, and um, I guess 10 generals are among them, high-ranked um, military people of Russia. We see that um, Russia was, uh, its troops were uh, pulled out from the central and northern parts of Ukraine 
from the regions uh, Kiev, Chernihiv, Sumy. It was not a gesture of goodwill. It was uh, a clear uh, victory of Ukrainian troops on the ground. Uh, but of course, this is a formidable enemy. And uh, we need, uh, first of all, military support from, our, from many countries, which is, of course, um, first of all, um, air defense, um, equipment, um, tanks, um, artillery. Ukraine is has already shown to the whole world that our army is very skilled. But of course, we need tools. We need tools to turn the tide in this terrible war and to put the end to the atrocities and to the bloodshed. Uh, the second thing is, of course, financial support, which is important for a country to keep its economy afloat, especially now in the times of the war. Uh, one of the main targets of the Russian army um, is the critical infrastructure, which is being damaged on a daily basis. Uh, they have already destroyed uh, hundreds of um, um, bridges, dozens of uh, oil depots, uh, parts of gas pipelines, airports, um, which means that a lot of effort, a lot of resource, a lot of manpower, and of course, a lot of uh, planning will be required. That is why we, of course, count on support of uh, many countries, our European partners, first of all, because um, I think it has become clear to everyone that Ukraine and its prosperity is an integral part of the um, uh, prosperous development of the whole uh, European continent. And the third thing, of course, is humanitarian support, uh, which uh, is uh, critical now, as the humanitarian situation is deteriorating, uh, to uh, support people on the ground in Ukraine. We have already reached the mark of 5.3 million uh, in terms of moving out of people out of Ukraine to the uh, neighboring countries. And um, I think around um, six and a half million Ukrainians have be um, become AD IDPs, which means that uh, they need to be supported. Sometimes I know it from many people in Ukraine, from my good friends, people are fleeing, leaving everything, uh, literally with only with a passport in the hand and a small bag. And that's it. So especially in the first weeks of the war, it was... Uh, uh, sometimes heartbreaking to see uh, children without warm clothes, everything which was so urgently needed. And thanks to the efforts of many humanitarian organizations, I think Ben will be able to um, uh, say more about it. Uh, we um, keep standing, we keep holding our ground because um, first of all, the utmost prior priority for us is of course to save people's life and to support those on the ground who are now in such a difficult situation. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll come to Ben, but uh, I have one uh, more question for you, and uh, then I'll probably move to Galina and then to Ben. Uh, you talked about support that you've got from Europe and also the support that you've got from US. Now, we are sitting here in Asia, and uh, this is a pertinent question. Uh, what do you think of the support that you have got from Asian countries? And the reason I'm asking this is, like, if you look at the United Nations General Assembly, and look at the response you had from Asian countries like China, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Iraq, Iran. All of these countries chose to abstain from the voting, right? So uh, if you were to argue a case one way, then you can say India and China alone are 50% of the world's population or 40% of the world's population. And that's already kind of, at least the governments are, uh, were not as responsive as, as we would have liked them to be. So uh, what do you think about the support or the lack thereof from the Asian counterparts? Well, um, I am uh, blessed to be ambassador of Ukraine to Singapore, the country which uh, showcased how um, important principles and values can be, uh, as we'll realize that um, we live in such a globalized world where the threat to one uh, imperils the security of all. Um, the businesses in the world are extremely interconnected. Societies are intermingled. Uh, we are, uh, we have become very interdependent. The clear um, uh, example was just the COVID pandemic, which has showcased uh, that we are all in the same boat. And what we see now, um, if we speak about the voting in the um, UNGA, um, first of all, we saw that 141 countries supported this resolution, the very first resolution, which in fact 
uh, declared Russia as a global pariah. There were countries which abstained. You know that there were also other draft resolutions which were adopted after that as a resolution on the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, as well as um, the resolution which was adopted and suspended Russia's participation in the UN um, Human Rights Council. There are countries which, of course, well, all countries, let's be honest, are led by their own interests, by their history, their economic um, uh, interests, and um, they take decisions based on that. My feeling is that if you speak about such global players as China, I really believe and I hope that um, this country will um, live up to its responsibility is the country which can really use its influence uh, and um, um, contribute to finding a peaceful solution. Because we all understand that um, the repercussions of uh, this war cannot be felt at once. It doesn't happen overnight, but this is like a snowball. So it's getting worse and worse. The price are uh, gonna soar for energy, for food. The um, uh, population of these countries, uh, also in Asia, in Africa, start feeling that uh, it's getting, uh, also in Europe, the whole world has not yet recovered from the COVID pandemic. There was already some crisis. The situation in Ukraine has uh, made it uh, even worse in terms of the Russian aggression. And we can, of course, see that um, um, the coming months will be critical and they will be also very difficult for many societies, especially for fragile ones in, in Asia and Africa, which are dependent on Ukrainian food exports. We see that the world uh, food program is already uh, stretched uh, to its limits, uh, and Ukraine has been feeding more than 400 million people. So I think the longer this war is ongoing, the more um, societies will feel it up close that um, uh, the war in Ukraine is um, um, quite a, well, quite a dangerous uh, situation also for uh, countries which seem to be so far away and maybe not really familiar with the culture and the history and the presence of the many European countries, including Ukraine. But again, in our globalized world, we all need to think um, about economic prospects, about the humanitarian situation, because we'll understand that if we achieve the situation where there is, again, poverty in some regions of the world, hunger, uh, it will um, push many societies for live in this country. So we'll have a refugee crisis again, which um, will be quite a challenge as uh, we all see that the world now needs some time to recover from so many crises which we have had. That's why the best way to stop it and the best way to get back to normal and to gain time and possibilities to, to recover is just to stop the senseless war. That is why all the joint efforts are needed. Sure. Thank you, Madam Ambassador for that uh, wonderful insight. And you talked about globalization, and I will next move on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Galina Kogut. So, uh, Dr. Galina Kogut, you are thousands of miles away from the land where you were born. You are uh, the president of the Ukrainian community in Singapore. Uh, so, the question to you uh, How did the Ukrainian community in Singapore react to the situation as when it happened? And what is the state of affairs now? It, we, are, we are more than two months into this situation. And a lot of uh, compatriots from your country are far away from the from the line of action. But how are they impacted by this? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. And it's a very good question on how the uh, Ukrainian uh, who live in Singapore, how it affected them. I, as it is like uh, Her Excellency mentioned, and that's a known fact now that, you know, now there is a globalized world. And whatever happens somewhere else, it just resonates everywhere. So, and more so, you know, we are Ukrainians. So it happens immediately to the country of our origin. Some people has, have spent uh, overseas for many years. Some people have just uh, come out of Ukraine. Uh, Singaporeans here are mostly professionals who are working here. In, I mean, in Singapore, Ukrainians who are working here, they're professionals. So they've spent here some time. And then when uh, the war started, there was, um, 
a challenge for the Ukrainians who live in Singapore on multiple planes. First of all, it was difficult to come up with the fact that this whole thing started, actually, that the war started. You know, I'm going back to the emotions and what I felt in the very beginning was I really wanted to, this to be some kind of a, like, maybe I'm just watching a horror movie or maybe I'm having a bad dream or something, but that was not a bad dream. And that was the reality which everybody had to face, including not only the Ukrainians, but including the Ukrainians who live everywhere else. So we are sort of like the secondary victims of what is happening there in Ukraine, but still we are. So um, the, the very first hours, the very first days, uh, the community here in Singapore, all Ukrainians, we kind of like, um, we, I don't know, somehow historically, uh, especially within the 30 years of Ukraine's independence, Ukrainians proved to be sort of like pretty much well, pretty well self-organized. So um, we started thinking how, I mean, we had our own problems to sort because uh, the relatives of some of our like when Russia started bombing in multiple cities, so all of us come from different parts of Ukraine. So all of us were worried for our loved ones, for everybody who is there in Ukraine. So that's number one challenge, emotional challenge you face. Then also you face the challenge, there was a lot of denial on the ground here in Singapore because uh, there was a lot of friends, uh, our community, we were friendly with the Russian community here. So we had to deal with that fact, you know, this kind of a betrayal, it hit very badly. So that's another problem. And uh, the problem is the whole country is at war. So we started, uh, we sort of like got together immediately and we were started, st we started thinking what, what is it that we can do? Uh, and of course, it, from the very first weeks, from the very first days, it was obvious that it's it's a, it's going to be a humanitarian disaster because um, it started from well, people had to flee from their homes uh, right within the first few days. Uh, they started bombing Kharkiv, they started bombing uh, on other cities and everywhere. Particularly, they just showed that none of the cities is safe. Uh, so we started thinking what we can do here from Singapore. Uh, and then uh, we, first of all, what we decided to do is the donation drives, you know, uh, what we can do is raising the awareness, trying to see, uh, trying to collect the money for the humanitarian needs there in Ukraine, uh, trying to see which organizations can partake in this, uh, which connections to make with which organizations, what we ourselves can do, you know, pri privately uh, send there on the ground, whatever our own money. So um, yes, so started moving. And then another big challenge which we faced was the information, uh, the information war, which was like the, there was a huge need, immediate need for truthful uh, information, you know, what's really happening so that uh, the fakes are not fed to people because this region, Singapore, Asia is really far away. So. Um, and people don't see immediately what is happening. It's not like Poland that the refugees are coming and they see what's happening over there. It's, Singapore is quite far. So we also stay in touch with the uh, uh, Ukrainian World Congress uh, in the region here. Uh, we, we are in communication and close cooperation with the uh, heads of communities, uh, leaders of the communities in the countries of the region like Australia, uh, Thailand, um, India. So we are all in touch, many, many countries, New Zealand also. So we are all in touch for, for multiple, um, you know, for multiple goals to achieve, for multiple ways to help uh, Ukraine. So uh, just to add on to that, uh, what was the response you got from the local community here, from the Singaporeans uh, to, to whatever drives you are running? Uh, did you, did, um, you could maybe talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so um, uh, the community here was quite helpful uh, in a way that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multiple dimension, you know, so we, we had to, uh, each of us was trying to make drives. Uh, I, 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 as a president, I received a lot of calls from the people here, from the Red Cross, from the UNHCR, uh, from other people who on, a, on their personal basis, not uh, the representatives of, of different organizations, but also um, personally people were approaching me asking how they can help. So uh, Singaporeans were very responsive and we were handling uh, like we were immediately 
uh, pulling up the information where Red Cross organized themselves very fast. They provided the way to, to donate the money. Also UNHCR, uh, SOFRA, and um, yeah, there were some other links also from the very beginning. We were just sending to everyone who wanted to donate, who wanted to help Ukraine. I also received the calls like on a personal basis from the people who knew Ukrainians here previously. I think uh, yeah, we have uh, we have Gracie here. She uh, she is a contact uh, from somebody who called me, uh, Belinda. She said that she wants to help people here in Singapore, Ukrainians who are handling this problem. So we started thinking and we're moving in the direction on how, how to provide the psychological psychological help to uh to the ukrainians here because um many people here are battling their depression because they they have their loved ones trapped there in the war so uh, i would say that generally the community in singapore was responsive thank you thank you for so much for that update so uh to the audience i can say that uh, you can type your questions in the chat you can also raise your hand i'll go to ben and then i'll open the floor for audience question so ben coming to you galina spoke quite highly of red cross and the efforts that uh, that red cross had lined up so uh could you uh, throw some light on the role that singapore red cross is playing in this situation sir you're on mute Yeah, sorry, Rao. Yeah, thanks, Rao, for having me on the panel. Yeah, um, it goes without saying, I think the, the offensive, the war and the conflict in Ukraine, now after two months, you know, it has plunged the whole country in into a human rights and humanitarian crisis. And what we see on the ground, you know, devastated lives of civilians throughout the country. I think uh, some of the estimates say that, you know, up to about 20 to 24 million people in Ukraine will need help, humanitarian assistance. That's more than half the population of Ukraine. Uh, as the ambassador said, uh, you know, about 5.5 million have left the country, but there's still another 15, 16 million within Ukraine who are internally displaced. And their access to necessities have also been curtailed. I mean, the major destruction of civilian infrastructure, um, hospitals, clinics, and even schools. So what is the critical role of uh, that Singapore Red Cross see itself playing? So I want to, first of all, distinguish ourselves from the Red Cross uh, globally. So there are many components of the Red Cross uh, and the ICRC plays a particular role, uh, especially in the area of uh, repatriate uh, of, um, the humanitarian corridors and things like that of safe passage. The IFRC coordinates a lot of the action on the ground. And each one of us as a national society is an independent organization. So for the Singapore Red Cross, I think very early in the conflict, we realized that this was going to be a humanitarian disaster. And we decided that the priority of Singapore Red Cross would be to help those in need. So what, what the, did helping those in need involve? So first of all, we realized that we needed to mobilize the Singapore public. Uh, I think it's a very powerful tool. Uh, and I must say that the uh, Singapore public has responded amazingly. Um, we launched a public appeal. Uh, besides the funds that were given to us by the Singapore government uh, of about 100,000 USD, uh, up to today, we have raised about $7 million from the Singapore public. So then the next question was, what is the priority on the ground? So we, we realized that besides the basic necessities like food and water, there were other uh, needs that needs, needed to be handled. And one of the biggest needs was medicine and medical help. Uh, with many of the hospitals and all that uh, either damaged or destroyed, uh, even access to medicine from people was by the people was uh, challenging. We are told that uh, one of the biggest challenge now faced by uh, displaced persons within Ukraine is uh, accessing healthcare for those with uh, chronic diseases. So, uh, you know, chronic disease which can be easily handled now becomes a severe uh, health hazard. So we have focused on uh, medicines. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also realized is that with the conflict on the ground, uh, both within Ukraine and those leaving, many of them have been injured, whether it's minor injuries or severe injuries. So we have been working with the Ukrainian Association to also provide um, uh, medical kits 
so that paramedics can bring it into Ukraine and uh, make it available to those who need help. But there are also very specific needs, but this whole area of medical needs is one big area. But we are also helping in the area of food. Uh, we've been working with some of the humanitarian actors on the ground. Uh, and um, But one of the things that emerging as a major uh, challenge will be uh, psychosocial support. So our next team of people going on the ground includes a psychosocial support team uh, wanting to reach out to especially the children who have been displaced. So these are some areas where we see is a critical role that Singapore Red Cross help, hopes to play. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, one question that I would like to ask you is that, yes, there is a, there is a donation drive that's going on and it's been quite successful. Uh, you mentioned more than $7 million have been raised yeah. on that. Uh, is, there, is there a way where people can contribute other than by donating cash? Okay, so I would say that uh, donating cash gives us a lot of flexibility in what we want to do on the ground and uh, we do what on the ground uh, according to the priorities and the needs. There are a couple of other ways. I, I would really discourage people from donating like secondhand clothes and all that, because these are very difficult to get into any disaster zone or crisis zone. Although we can get small quantities, uh, you know, as it were personally carried. But there's one other area. I mean, we do need medicines. We do need uh, supplies, big supplies of uh, equipment, medical equipment. Now, if you are a supplier, or if you know of a supplier and you want to donate things that are new or of, of, of a reasonable quantity, uh, this is something that we can look in and look into, and we can work with you to uh, secure these supplies and then uh, with our resources, send it to uh, our warehouses in Poland where it can then be brought into Ukraine. So there's some scope for things beyond cash, but uh, fairly limited. Uh, and but. If you have an idea, please uh, do contact us and we'll be able to work with you. Thank you, thank you so much. So we have some questions on the chat and uh, I would uh, request uh, Shantanu to go ahead and voice his question. Shantanu, and you might want to introduce yourself, tell where you're speaking from. Okay, while we wait for Shantanu, let me go to Caleb. Caleb, why don't yeah, you- hi. Uh, Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm, I'm in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, so the question I was asking was to Madam um, Ambassador, I think what is critical to understand is that how flexible is the Ukrainian government to arrive at some sort of a compromise because the situation is pretty grim, right? I mean, it's going to be a very long drawn out conflict. If this doesn't, if, if you don't, uh, move towards some sort of a resolution because um, I think the, the Russians are quite willing to continue doing this for, a, for an extended period of time. So what is the stance that, uh, because we've not really, you know, beyond saying that, yes, we will not give up any land, any territory, um, what, is, what is realistically the, the government willing to do to ensure that uh, this comes to an end faster than later. Thank you for this question. Um, yes, every war inevitably ends with um, negotiations and with uh, any agreement which can put an end to, to, to the uh, fire, to the deaths and injuries and destructions. And of course, uh, the ultimate priority for us is to stop the further bloodshed because we are on a daily basis losing our people, many civilians. Um, more than 220 children have been already killed in this war. Um, nothing to say about the destructions and uh, the damage to, to the um, economy of the country. Um, of course, there must be some balanced decision. And uh, we have already had six rounds of negotiations with the Russian side. What we can say is that uh, in order to achieve substantial progress in the, um, towards the ceasefire, we really need some guarantees. Uh, with the hindsight and with the sad experience, uh, bitter experience, which we already had with the Budapest Memorandum, 
uh, you remember as Ukraine gave up its uh, uh, world third biggest nuclear potential in exchange of security guarantees. Um, that was not um, effective. Moreover, one of the guarantors of this Budapest, under this Budapest memorandum, was the Russian Federation, which exactly 20 years later attacked Ukraine, occupied the territory of Crimea, and uh, instigated the war in Ukrainian Donbas. Um, there are many questions about any possible decision of Ukraine to, to become neutral. What is neutrality? Neutrality is um, uh, the situation or the status for the country where it does not belong to any bloc and is actually neutral militarily. Uh, believe it or not, Ukraine used to be neutral till 2014, as Russia occupied Ukrainian Crimea and instigated the war in Donbas. We have already experience with neutrality. And given the fact that we will always have two and a half more than two and a half thousand um, kilometers common um, border with the Russian Federation. We have to deal with that. And we need to have the kind of security guarantees which will um, protect us from further possible uh, attacks from the Russian Federation. Yes, you are right. We see that the President Putin lives in the world of his own and he is determined to, to move forward. Sometimes I think that he does not really have the whole picture, or maybe he's deceived by those who inform him about what's the real situation on the ground in Ukraine, about that losses which his army is suffering. Um, but the fact is that um, there is still a long way to go. There are things which we cannot uh, consider as possible compromise um, if it comes to the territorial integrity of Ukraine and its state sovereignty. This is something which is not negotiable. So it means that um, we are in that process, but this is a very hard situation. There are many hard talks about it. And the main thing is that it is always effective to, to speak from the position of strength when you know that your diplomats are backed by the strong army and uh, that uh, you can be a game changer and you can decide what's going to be on the agenda thank you so much ma'am for that uh, for that answer uh, we have yet another question yes, for you and that's coming from caleb caleb uh, please go ahead and ask your question yeah okay hi so initially, I addressed the question to uh, the ambassador, but I think I'll address it to Dr. Galena also, because I think she also uh, understands uh, the policy also. So the question, okay, maybe I'll introduce myself. I'm Caleb, I'm a software developer. I'm from Singapore. So, so my question uh, to the panelists is, um, I, I mean, we all know that Putin is very stubborn when it comes to decisions and, and especially um, territorial gains and what has been happening, happening in the Donbass, at least for the past eight years. So... Uh, Recently, right, I think if you guys follow the news, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, have visited Russia and Ukraine to sort of find a compromise to stop the, to stop the war. So how do you think the world, as in the world government and, and, and governments from different countries, can convince the Russian government to stop the war in Ukraine? Maybe if I may just start um, sure. the question, you know, you all know we've been at war since 2014, more than eight years of experience in dealing with uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, there have been um, many attempts, including compromise, uh, compromises made, um, uh, which um, were clear evidence that any uh, attempt to, uh, to find a compromise or um, to appease the perpetrator only emboldened him to move forward and uh, makes his appetite grow. That's what we saw. And um, that's what actually then happened. Everyone, or at least many, thought that uh, Russia would always stay and destabilize the certain regions of Ukraine in the Eastern parts of it. But now we see that Putin wants Ukraine as a whole because a prosperous Ukraine poses a threat to his own dictatorship and his own future. Um, in uh, his country. And if I say so, it's not just an egoistic approach of a Ukrainian official. We are now protecting the whole Europe. 
because we all see we all see what is now happening towards um, uh, Moldova. We all see that the situation is deteriorating, and um, it is uh, not to rule out that uh, Putin, if he is not stopped now on Ukrainian soil, um, will just um, stop doing so and will get enough of it. I'm afraid that it will only uh, embolden him with his aggressive actions toward other countries, which we will not allow. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Kogut, would you like to add something to that? Um, well, uh, Her Excellency has put it very nicely, uh, the explanation. I would just probably wanted to add that um, it's, um, you know, these are the two antagonizing uh, forces uh, at conflict now, the, the big, huge empire uh, the wannabe empire, the country which wants to be empire, which wants to go over the border and capture other countries, and Ukraine, uh, the principle of which is democracy. You know, we've been democratic for centuries. We come from the from the historically, we are the, the descendants of the Cossacks who has who, who have always had the democratic rules. Uh, you know, reigning in our in our land, and this is like these are two antagonizing forces, which will uh, it will be very difficult to come to some kind of a middle decision because no matter uh, even if we go for anything peaceful settlement, this is just not going to stop. Like uh, Madam Ambassador said, and we've tried many times. Ukraine tried many times. And this just doesn't stop. And I don't think, yes, if Ukraine is captured, the, the big empire with all its appetites uh, will stop. And the situation is aggravated by the propaganda. Uh, you know, the, the fact that there is no democracy also influences the fact that people are simply brainwashed. And even the leader, uh, like uh, 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 Madam Katerina said that maybe the leader is also misinformed. Maybe his, uh, you know, his minions are just too scared to tell him that, look, we lost this, we lost this many thousands. And, you know, the information he's getting is literally, he's probably believing in the lies he is producing and feeding to others. So uh, it's just the whole, you know, the whole situation, the propaganda is aggravating the whole thing, because even if we wanted to go out to Russians and tell them, look, people, what you're doing is wrong. Can you just explain to your leader? It will be very difficult because they are all brainwashed. So this, uh, and I don't know how, you know, if there is any way to settle things in between, because this is just not going to stop on, on the part of, uh, of, the, of the wannabe empire. Sure. It's, it's, it's very hard to stop because the Russians will get to jail for like 20 years if they do anti-war protests in Russia or, or, or anything on the ground. So there's this, there's this, okay, for you guys don't know what's happening in Russia, there's this censorship board called Ross Commander, and they would censor anything that you say against the Russian government. So a lot of Russian independent media were forced to close down because of that. Because they recognize what is happening in Ukraine as a war and not a special military operation. So it's, it's, it's very tough. Yes, they are brainwashed. But at the same time, um, I was just wondering where th there's, there's a way we can unite the Russians against what Putin is doing and overthrow him. I mean, if we can do that, we can overthrow Lukashenko also. So that, that is just something I'm, I'm curious about, you know, for Dr. Galina. Um, it's difficult to say. Um, I know what you're talking about. I know what is a censorship. I grew up in the USSR. Uh, I know how the machine works. I know how the principles work. Uh, yeah, it takes years. I, I don't think Ukraine can wait for that. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll just uh, pick on that and I'll then go to Praveen who has raised his uh, hand, but let me just uh, pick on what you said. You grew up in the USSR and incidentally, I happen to understand that both you and Madam uh, Katrina Zelenko are from the same city of Venezia. So maybe you could just uh, both of you talk about a little bit about what it is growing like in, in, in Ukraine in general, and maybe in your city, Venezia, what is it like? Uh, so that, see, most of us would not know uh, what it is like to be growing up in USSR or in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Madam, Madam, Madam Zelenko, would you want to go first? Well, you know, um, one of... Um... Well, the things we can uh, definitely say about that legacy which we got is the fact that um, many people who grew up in this, um, um, let's say, well, 
end of the Soviet era and then uh, early post-Soviet era are those who have been very well educated with very good school education, with a high level of um, cultural development. We all as kids, uh, I'm sure Galina too, uh, were always uh, had to go to the musical school and play the piano. Uh, we were reading lots of books and actually we were in the very first years of independence of Ukraine, because I um, grew up, well, the first 10 years in the Soviet Union, and then after the Soviet Union collapsed, we still remain in the same school, which used to be a Soviet one, but then the Soviet school appeared to be a post-Soviet one. And that was a period of time where many of us uh, got information through the lens of Ukraine, which actually uh, appeared to be the country um, which now has a great chance to finally um, become European as it actually always used to be. But we always were in the shadow of the Soviet Union. Because if you look at the history of um, Ukraine, the history of all its attempts to gain its independence, there are many different, um, sometimes tragical chapters in our history, in our common history, as Vladimir Putin called it. Uh, such as um, executed renaissance, for example, not everyone knows about it. This is a very interesting part of our history in the 1930s, as the whole blossom of Ukrainian cultural, educational, scientific elite was just executed in the labor camps or just put there where they died of dehydration and hunger and uh, diseases. Uh, it was made deliberately because these were those who were able to uh, to turn the tide, to bring changes, who uh, were interested in gaining independence of our country. Or if you take Holodomor, uh, so-called Great Famine, 1932-1933, uh, it's also part of our Soviet legacy, where six million Ukrainians died just because the um, uh, Soviet regime expropriated all the grain from uh, um, the yards and they remained without anything. And people starved and were dying on the streets, literally. Um, and that was the time where we also lost many Ukrainian, um, fantastic Ukrainian people, also from the cultural region, but, but mostly uh, the peasants. And um, if you look at that, then you realize that actually this country always had this, um, this something special in it, some kind of a struggle for its being uh, itself, being a prosperous European uh, society. This is kind of a, a national, some people call it national identity. I would say this is kind of a code which we have in us. And now this is something which we realize that is so strong and it united us. It's also true to say that it is Putin who united the Ukrainian nation as no one before, because now we definitely know what we are fighting for. I'm not sure if these Russian soldiers who came on our soil do. I can, I can relate to that. I, I spent my formative years in India. And uh, I think uh, in our history, we were most united under the British Empire because we had a common enemy against which all Indians, no matter what color, what religion, what race, were fighting against. So I can totally relate to what you said about how Putin invariably ended up uniting Ukraine. So coming back to uh, you, Galina, about the same experience of living in the same city as, as Madame Zelenko, Vinitsia, which I understand is a chocolate city of, uh, of Ukraine. So what's your experience been like, like looking in the USSR and suddenly you are in an independent Ukraine, did something change in your schools, language, medium of, in, medium of instructions or whatever else you want to talk about? Um, yeah, the, our city has become chocolate city. It's just like in the past uh, maybe 10, 15 years. Before that, it was nothing, not really a chocolate city. It was just a city of, uh, we call them cherry blossoms. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful picturesque place in Ukraine, within Ukraine. It's like a southern uh, central part. And uh, I will just tell you one story, you know, like to add on to what Miss Katerina said. Um, I also experienced this uh, transition from the USSR to the post-USSR Ukraine. And as we were the kids, uh, the teenagers, you know, in school, that was still the USSR. 
uh, but that was like almost uh, at the break, uh, almost before the USSR collapsed. And there was, uh, you know, at that time, Gorbachev, he has introduced this uh, perestroika, Glasnys, Glasnys meant that the information could be given to people and uh, there was a lot of information coming out about the uh, Holodomor because people didn't know all that. We lived in the USSR and we literally thought the Second World War started in 1994, uh, 1991 instead of 1939. You mean, no, you mean 41? Uh, 41, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we didn't know that there was the agreement between Molotov and Ribbentrop in 1939 we didn't know, people just didn't know about that. We didn't know our own history. We didn't know the atrocities which Russia was putting on Ukraine even before uh, it became, uh, it started, it became a part of the USSR. We didn't know about hulags. We didn't know about all those things. So uh, then at the end of eighties, the beginning of nineties, all this information came about. And then we started uh, thinking of oh, what were, what have they actually been doing with us? You know, they were suppressing us. And then uh, like, yeah, the, the killed uh, Renee and uh, that we didn't know, we didn't learn in school many of the uh, people, many of the great, uh, uh, you know, writers, poets, uh, uh, artists, we didn't know about them because they were fighting for Ukraine's independence even within the USSR. So, uh, and then we got that information all of a sudden, our parents gave us that information and we were little thinking, you know, teenagers. So we were singing uh, Cervona Kalina, the, the, the anthem, this is like a second uh, national anthem of Ukraine that we have our official anthem and Chervona Kalina is a very popular song. It's a song of the Ukrainian uh, army who was fighting uh, with the, uh, both with the Germans and with the USSR, with the Russia. So this Chervona Kalina, the lyrics just goes that uh, Chervona Kalina is a, is a tree with the red uh, berries, you know. It's, it's, it's famous in Ukraine and it's a symbol of Ukraine. It's one of the symbols of Ukraine. So the song just goes that Chervona Kalina is sad. So we are trying to cheer uh, our Chervona Kalina up and we are trying to cheer Ukraina up, Ukraine up. So we stood up our whole class of the little thinking, uh, critical thinking uh, teenagers, and we sang that song. And the principal, the headmaster of our school, when he heard that, he said that we are Nazis. So you just connect this to what Putin is saying now. The whole of Ukraine, just because we know who we are, just because we want to be who we are, just because we don't want to assimilate, we don't want to blend with the empire, we are all Nazis. Thank you, thank you for that insight. Uh, Praveen has been waiting very long for his questions. Praveen, our uh, floor is yours now. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, basically, uh, my name is Praveen. Uh, I was in uh, uh, Poland uh, actually a couple of weeks back uh, to help with the uh, refugee situation uh, with the Rotary Clubs in uh, uh, Poland. Um, actually, I've got uh, two questions. Um, actually, one is for uh, Madam uh, Ambassador. I just want to know, like, um, what um, what else actually um, can Singapore do? Uh, maybe in politically uh, or economically. Uh, they can uh, maybe have sanctions against uh, Russia to help with the, with the, with the uh, uh, sanctioning uh, Russia. And uh, my next question is actually to uh, Mr. Ben. Uh, I actually met um, Mr. Sahari and uh, Karun in, uh, in, in Poland. So uh, we had a chat with them. And then I was also wondering, like, is there a necessity? Um, what kind of necessity is there in uh, the neighboring countries uh, to help with the refugee situation under the Red Cross of Singapore? And also, what is the... Um, where do we draw the line for humanitarian aid? Because uh, one of the uh, questions that was posed to me um, uh, uh, to, to, to me in Poland was actually the help for um, uh, body armor was actually part of humanitarian aid. And then some had some dispute with that. So I was just wondering, I mean, um, Madam Ambassador could also highlight on uh, this point as well. Thank you. So, so maybe we can get Ben to answer your humanitarian question first, and then uh, we can come back to Madam Ambassador. Is that okay, Praveen? Yeah. So, so Ben, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks, Raul. Thanks, Praveen. Yes, uh, I, I did receive a report from uh, Sari and Karun to say that they've met you. And I think you sort of, uh, by you were on the way back and they had just got in. I, I think uh, over the last couple of weeks as they've been on the ground, I think they've been uh, uh, doing a good job of coordinating our assistance. I think the uh, great need on the ground now is things like uh, basic necessities like medicine. In fact, we will also be distributing hygiene kits to the women. I think uh, some of these things we take for granted, but I think uh, as uh, Ambassador 
I think Ambassador Galina mentioned, uh, you know, many people left just with their passport and their small bag. So, you know, there's uh, a lot of uh, need for the people who are living now in the displaced camp, displacement camps in Poland and Hungary and the other countries. So I think for the time being, that will be our main focus, medicines, basic necessities uh, uh, to the, to the uh, displaced persons. But the next step and the next step, in fact, the next team that's going up in May, uh, early May, uh, actually includes uh, psychosocial support uh, practitioners. So one of the needs that has been identified on the ground is the need to support, especially the children, and those who are traumatized uh, with psychosocial support. So I think this is a program that we will see uh, take on a bit more prominence going forward. Uh, but I think as far as the basic necessities are concerned, I think those are still priorities. As far as drawing the line is concerned, I think as a humanitarian organization and especially as Red Cross as mandated by the Geneva Convention, we will not get involved in arming uh, the military or supporting the military. Uh, we we don't take sides with the military. We don't. Uh, we know who is right, who is wrong, but we don't use that as a premise for our assistance. Our assistance is those who need uh, help. And today in Ukraine, it is obvious that the people who need help most are those who have been displaced uh, internally, uh, as well as those who have been forced to leave the country and take refuge in another country. So that's where our focus will be. Thank so, you. Just, just to, to to interrupt. Uh, like 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 I said, um, in terms of body armor, right? It was not for the military, but for the uh, civilians. So how how would you draw the line in that in that respect? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a difficult line to draw because uh, you know one can argue that if you are taking body armor, that is really military equipment. Uh, so for most Red Cross societies, we will uh, shy away from supporting people with body armor. Yeah, we will focus on those that are clearly humanitarian in nature. Yeah, but of course, you know, one can always argue whether that is uh, something that is needed. Yeah, you may be, may be willing to supply body armor for someone who's bringing in a humanitarian from within the organization. That means from a Red Cross member, you know, supply him with bulletproof vests or what so that he's protected. But we won't go into the business of supplying others with body armor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that clarity. Uh, Praveen, your other question, other part of your question was directed to Madam Ambassador. So, uh, Madam Ambassador, over to you. Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, Praveen, for, for that, what you are doing, for your uh, contribution, which is also critical. Thanks to people like you, we, st we still keep holding out because uh, we know that uh, there are people of goodwill willing to support and doing their part for the humanity. In fact, we're all, uh, we see that this is a, a huge challenge to our common humanity. And we all can see in the case of Ukraine, how important it is just to look out for one another and take care of one another. And yes, um, good that we have actually mentioned the um, uh, armored um, as protections or personal protection uh, bulletproof requests. I know that there have been um, some stories from the first days of the war where we were short of this uh, protection um, equipment for volunteers, for other peoples where uh, sometimes volunteers, volunteers were, were killed just because they were trying to evacuate children and there were not enough uh, vests at their disposal and they just put off their own vests, put them on, on the child and were killed like that. So uh, this is something which is of course heartbreaking. That's why the need um, for um, uh, such protective things is really urgent. But speaking about the other, uh, other ways to support Ukraine uh, in this regard, I would like to say that, first of all, we are grateful to many people in Singapore. We are overwhelmed by the messages of support, emails, which we um, were getting from the very first day of uh, this invasion, where people uh, offered their support, um, uh, wanted to, to raise funds, to make their contributions. And um, uh, this is something which we are very grateful for. Um, there is also one more point which I would like to uh, emphasize. It is, um, what is actually the best way to stop the war? 
is to deprive the perpetrator of the means or of the revenues which allow him to finance this terrible war machine. Um, this is, of course, uh, business, doing business with Russia. We, know, we all understand that Russia is uh, uh, earning uh, millions of dollars uh, thanks to its uh, uh, energy business, to selling oil, gas. We see uh, how many European countries are now struggling to become independent from uh, Russia's blackmailing them um, by means of energy, which is actually not new. It's always the same playbook. We already experienced it many times. What is the best way to do so? It's, of course, cutting off business with Russia. Um, uh, we know that more than 750 companies, international companies, have already left the Russian market. Uh, but there are still hundreds which remain and which keep paying taxes, uh, which means that uh, uh, the Kremlin puts all this resource for uh, maintenance and strengthening of its military capabilities. Every cent gained by the Russian Federation uh, is put on the strengthening of its military capacities. They are also running out of equipment. We have already destroyed hundreds of Russian tanks and uh, lots of Russian uh, um, uh, helicopters and aircrafts. It means that um, everyone can actually contribute by stopping doing business with this country. This is something which is important. Sanctions are an integral part of the whole package of measures alongside military support and humanitarian support and financial support for Ukraine, uh, because um, this is also part of the issue if we speak about um, who could be the game changer in the situation. Definitely can be Russian people, which could uh, stop Putin. Uh, and what we see now is already the fact that um, um, Russia is um, already suffering, suffering losses. Uh, Russian people will start, start losing jobs. Um, the prices for food are in Russia also skyrocketing. So there are already very elements of it, but it uh, takes time, as uh, Elena mentioned. It takes time, which we lack, because we lose our people on a daily basis. So um, any measures which have to be taken have to be taken now. Sure. So, uh, so far we have covered how big the crisis is, what's the economic impact of the war. We're going to cover a few more things. Uh, if you have questions or if you would like to ask question, um, I'll, I'll pause here, uh, raise your hand and we can take question. Otherwise I have some questions. Okay, uh, Smith has a question. Smith, go ahead. Uh, I just wanna wish Her Excellency the absolute best for the war. Slava Ukraini. My grandfather, unfortunately, was killed in Ukraine 110 years ago in World War II, and I have strong empathy and uh, sympathy for the situation the Ukrainian people are in. Slava, Ukraine. Heroin Slava. Thank you so much for that, Smith. And uh, let me let me come to something which Madam Zelenko, you said that uh, Putin has united uh, Ukraine like never before. Uh, whether you li listen to Kira Rudek or you listen to uh, Poroshenko or you listen to uh, uh, the, the, the mayor of Kiev, or you listen to President Zelenko. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Pres President Zelensky, not Zelenko. Zelenko. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, what people don't realize, I mean, I, I, me, I'm not a Ukrainian, and when I hear this news, it to me it appears these are all part of the government, these are all the same people. What we don't realize is these are all people from different political parties. So Poroshenko, Zelensky, Kira Rudik, uh, or the mayor of Kiev, they're all from different political party. How is it that uh, despite being from different political parties, when you listen to the interviews of these people, all of them speak one language. It is as if there is one big machinery that is speaking. Uh, how is how has that happened? I mean, I, I, I'm really curious to know about this. Yeah, I think this is the phenomenon of uh, of the war of, of the war, which uh, was. Uh... Uh, launched by the Russian Federation, by, by the country which is aimed at destroying of, of uh, Ukraine. If you look at the history of other countries who had to struggle for their own um, uh, independence and for their survival, you could also see the same. Let's take, for example, Israel, the same. All uh, who were oppos um, the, in the opposition or all the ruling parties, they just had to come together in order to achieve the common goal. We all need to realize that if Russia stops fighting, there will be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. 
and where everyone has to be absolutely clear about it. It's all about our um, existence and, of course, uh, about our future and the future of our children. Sure, sure. So are there any questions from the audience? Shantanu, you have a question? I, I see something you put in the chat. Yeah, um, what I would like to um, say that, you know, I think obviously uh, Ukraine would and all of us would like to see that, you know, maximum pressure is is put on the Russians through the sanctions. But it does appear that there are limitations to that. Um, the, the entire piece about gas for Western Europe is not an easy question to answer because it's it, it would lead to a significant amount of damage to the economies of the West. Uh, it may it may stop Putin, it may not stop Putin, but it will definitely damage the Western economies. And as a result of which, it could also lead to a backlash from the from the local people there uh, against uh, you know things to be done for the war. Um, so it's a very fine balancing act to ask for that particular uh, ultimate step. But in the absence of which, unfortunately, it does seem that Putin will continue to earn significant amounts of revenue from the gas exports. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's right for Ukraine to perhaps push for it, but I think it, what I would like to uh, you know, ask Madam Ambassador is that I'm sure that Ukraine understands that there are limitations to that piece and therefore a complete collapse of Russian revenues is at least not in the next six or eight months a reality. So that's, it, it may be something that may, they may hope for, but it's not likely to happen. And therefore, how you really deal with that situation that, uh, you know, that the Russians are going to run out of money to fight in the next six to eight months is, is, uh, is the question. So, uh, yes, all the other support will come and all that will happen. But the reality is that the Russian machine can grind on for a significantly longer period of time. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Thank you. This is a very difficult question indeed. Um... You know, I think maybe this is the reason why we always say that the most important thing now is for Ukraine to get enough uh, military support in order to be able to defeat Russia on the ground in Ukraine, just to uh, let them suffer to such an extent that there is no other choice. But this is something which can be only reached if you have enough uh, equipment, heavy equipment, which will uh, be not only defensive, but which can also allow you to um, start offensive operations. But this is something which is, of course, a matter of time. And um, now we still keep standing, we, we still keep holding our ground. Uh, but um, everyone has to realize that uh, we keep losing, we keep losing our people. This is the most terrible thing. Uh, yes, it is um, uh, the decisions which are being made now by many governments in Europe uh, and far beyond, uh, they come with a price. They are very painful. And um, um, there is just always a choice which uh, all governments have, um, the European governments, which start speaking about recession, about the economic crisis, which can uh, result from measures taken and um, from cutting off energy um, purchases of energy, oil and gas from the Russian Federation. Um, but, you know, uh, on one hand, they can have recession in Europe. On the other hand, they can have genocide in the very heart of Europe. There's always a choice. And I think uh, the painful price, which um, the governments in Europe are going to pay for that is not to compare with the losses of lives which uh, we have in Ukraine where mothers have to bury their children, where in the 21st century people stay in the basements and in shelters uh, for weeks and months, sometimes without food and medical aid and without water and just do not have anything to give uh, to their children. So this is something which um, we have to stop because again, um, we live in, in, in Europe where every country depends on another. And if we do not stop it now, we will have even a worse situation in the future. 
because um, if we do not suffer this short-term pain for the long-term gain, maybe it will be too late if we take half mass decisions and just do not uh, uh, act determined as we hope will be done. Thank you. Uh, we are like five minutes short of closing the session. So uh, why don't I ask you some difficult questions, uh, which is probably on everybody's mind. Uh, how is the war likely to end? What are the possible resolutions? Madam Zelenko, that's for you. What do you think is the end, uh, end looking like? No one knows what's going to be the end game, and no one knows when it will end. Um, what we see now and what we all realize, the war will not end overnight. Uh, it will take time. It will take um, many efforts, a lot of planning, a lot of resource, definitely. But the end game will very much depend on the volume of support we are going to get. Um, that will be um, the decisive factor, actually. Of course, there are many elements to consider. Uh, but um, if we get all the necessary equipment we need as soon as possible, um, I think we will be able to bring this war to an end within weeks or maybe months. But no one can predict it, predict it for sure. You see, the situation is changing uh, rapidly. And every day we have some new uh, situation we have to deal with. Um, that is why it is so important now to join efforts and to act as, as a coalition, as a coalition of countries willing to uh, finally achieve some stability, uh, to achieve peace, to achieve ceasefire, to stop uh, this terrible war. This is in terms of the number of atrocities, this is the most devastating war since the Second World War. And I always say, you just have to keep in mind that the largest by territory country of the world has attacked the largest by territory country of Europe. This is a huge dimension of this war and the repercussions will be also significant. Sure, sure. That's a, that's a very good uh, perspective you brought, but the largest country in the world has attacked the largest country in Europe. We often don't uh, think of think in those terms, but that's a very uh, reality of the situation. Also, one reality is that the World Bank predicts that the GDP of Ukraine is going to shrink by 45%, So, which means that uh, a country which has a GDP of close to uh, $170 billion is now going to be uh, somewhat in the range of $70 to $80 billion. So uh, that itself is a crisis. And on top of that, uh, estimates say that so far, Russia has destroyed $100 billion worth of uh, infrastructure in, in Ukraine. And there, we are hearing from some quarters that probably the Russian money, which has been uh, frozen uh, overseas uh, by the central banks overseas, uh, that should probably be repatriated to, uh, to Ukraine to, to build up uh, what has been destroyed by the, by the Russian government. Uh, Madam Zelenko, do you think that is uh, that is uh, legally possible? Uh, do you, uh, I mean, that would be one of its first if it ever happens. Well, I think um, there can be dif different options we can uh, uh, speak about, but we also need to be clear about the fact that now, while we are speaking, uh, Russian uh, missiles are destroying more and more uh, parts of Ukrainian infrastructure, and we still do not know uh, what uh, uh, volume of support and of resource will be needed because the damage, the damage is really massive. So that's why um, we will we'll have to see how it ends and how it will be uh, streamlined. Um, there are many elements of of that um, uh, problem. Uh, we see that we have to deal with it in terms of the bringing the perpetrator to account in the international court. The ICJ is already working on that and ICC too. We will have to deal with uh, many uh, financial problems uh, which will not only be about Ukraine but also about the whole Europe. That's why we have seen the commitment which was um, stated by uh, the European Commission that uh, Europe is ready to support to reconstruct uh, Ukraine and to revive its economy and to help um, to, to keep it afloat and to move forward of course. 
Uh, but first of all, the ultimate priority now is just to stop the war and to achieve this ceasefire. This is something which is urgently needed for our people and for all Europeans. Yeah, and Praveen has put uh, a question. Again, Madam Ambassador, I have to keep coming back to you because people are asking you questions. Uh, do you think that uh, Putin or Russia will stop uh, if they control the Donbass region? Or would it stop there? Definitely not. Definitely not, okay. It will be just the beginning. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, we are almost uh, dot on time uh, in, in terms of uh, the allot allotted time for the session. So uh, I would like to go, I, I would like to first ask if there is any final question that anybody wants to ask that, uh, that the, our panelists can take. Rahu, Rahu, Tonghai had a question, he posted a question. Sure, sure. sure go ahead. No, Tonghai, not me, Tonghai. Tonghai, oh, Tonghai. Tonghai, please go ahead and ask your question. Sure, hi, hi. Um, sorry, ma'am, sorry for this last question. Uh, uh, I'm with a group of students uh, and we have been watching uh, Ukrainian's uh, communications effort with uh, interest Really, um, you have been able to um, mobilize people through uh, President Zelensky's lenses and speeches. I mean, Russians also have their ways to tell their version of their, sto their stories to their people. But interestingly, um, and briefly, what is Ukraine's recipe for success in your communication to the world today? Can you just share a bit of your thoughts on this? Thank you. Yes, you know, uh, over the last eight years, we have been... Um gaining muscles in terms of dealing with disinformation and fake news campaign because uh, honestly speaking in 2014 as uh, Russia started um, its aggression against Ukraine no one in Ukraine and in Europe were, was really prepared for such a, a high scale of disinformation and fake news which became a part of this aggression actually um we are still dealing with these challenges but we are much better armed in terms of information and communication and strategic communications through which we've been working at now i think everyone in europe is much more vigilant as we used to be and this is critical because just yesterday i saw the news that uh, um, the russian federation the mfa russia is preparing the press tour for western journalists to Mariupol to show the atrocities caused by the Ukrainian military against its people. I don't know who, so who they are going to bring there and uh, where they are going to find this, all these actors who will uh, say that they've been, um, I don't know, uh, attacked or killed uh, or their children killed or they were injured by uh, the Ukrainian uh, military. So they always be, have been good in that. But this is something where I would really urge every one of you to, to be more vigilant and to be more curious, to double check the facts. Now we have so many independent investigative initiatives uh, and journalists working on the ground in Ukraine, like the Bellingcat. You can always rely on, on the information provided by the Human Rights Watch or just see what uh, is published by the journalists working on the ground in Ukraine. Now we have so many who really try to provide the audiences with the um, appropriate information about what's really uh, going on. Uh, we all have seen what um, uh, was uh, um, uh, happening in Bucha, uh, this terrible, terrible, inhuman uh, crimes against humanity, everything which we could see there hundreds of killed people, tortured, uh, raped, uh, raped children, something which you cannot even imagine in the 21st century. And uh, um, the good thing is that we managed to bring many official delegations there, the politicians, the decision makers in Europe who could see with their own eyes what, what it is how it can look like, what is the modern warfare um, started and launched by the Russian Federation. So that is why I think it's important to spread the word, to speak with many people. If you do not trust in some source of information, you can always find someone, um, maybe in Ukraine, who knows, who has friends, who has relatives, and you will see this absolutely real people with their real human tragedies. Uh, with real losses and uh, see that if we do not stop it, it will 
will one day happen to anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. So uh, we have almost come to the end of our session. I would just go around our panelists, starting with Ben, and ask if they have any final message that they want to leave the audience with. Uh, I, oops, what if I, sorry, I have nothing much more to add, except to say that the task ahead of us is tremendous. I think there's a huge, uh, massive humanitarian response that is needed and it's ongoing. And we just need to come together to uh, uh, work together to make this happen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kogut, over to you. Um, thanks much. I also don't have much to add, just the fact that uh, let's just all stay together because this is not just a problem of Ukraine, uh, between the Ukraine, that Russia attacked Ukraine. This, I mean, we're, we are living in the global world. And this could have happened to anyone. We do have small countries. We do have big countries in the world. We do have more powerful countries. We, we do have less powerful countries. So, and if anything like this happens anywhere else, I think we should put away, put aside all our differences. And I guess the people who are here with us today, definitely they're the people who care. So if you had uh, any kind of insights today, uh, please go around when you meet your friends, uh, pass this message, why the help is needed, uh, what is going on as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gobit. Uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, you have the final say in this. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for staying curious and for being interested in um, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, in a country which is actually so far away from Singapore. Um, you know, in the age of social media and of uh, image-driven emotionality, sometimes public opinion can be fickle. And um, for Ukraine to succeed, it is critical that um, global public opinion will hold strong on its behalf. That is why um, my call on you is just to um, stay very well informed, uh, follow the news and try to do your part for the humanity. Everyone can contribute by raising funds, by speaking with people, by helping out um, in uh, some initiatives, social initiatives, there are so many now. And um, uh, if you really want to help, or if you know someone who wants to help but needs more additional information, you can always um, count on us, on our embassy, on our team, and you can always uh, put questions also to Ben, to Singapore Red Cross, whom we enjoy excellent cooperation with. Um, supporting Ukraine, you support your societies, your countries in securing a predictable, secure, and safe world. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for, for that message. I would just conclude by saying that uh, there is actually three types of war that, uh, that are being fought at the moment. One is the territorial war, which we see on our TVs that uh, Russian and Ukraine forces are fighting to gain territory. So that is something which we see on TV. But then at the same time, there is an economic war where, uh, which is also being fought uh, through sanctions. And then lastly, there is the information war. Now the first two, territorial war and the economic war, we sitting in Singapore or India or China or far away from the land of action do not have much control. But where we do have control is the information war. So if we are getting some information, if we are seeing something on social media or even in the mainstream news, uh, onus is on us to check, to verify, and to know what we are digesting and not to propagate something which is uh, either false or is damaging because it's not correct. So with that, uh, I would say that yes, we are all uh, part and parcel of this war because it's not just something which is happening in Ukraine thousands of kilometers away from us, but something that affects all of us, all of us in this globalized world, both in terms of uh, energy crisis, in terms of food crisis, and also in terms of how the information is being uh, digested by us. So with that, I would like to conclude. I hope that you have found this session useful. Uh, do contribute in your way that you can. Besides the information war, there is uh, 
there is humanitarian uh, aid that you can contribute to. There are a lot of people in this session that I know of, uh, particularly Praveen, who has been very active. He went all the way from Singapore to Poland to help with the crisis there. Uh, there is Gotham in this group who has been very curious with his questions, who has been asking those thought provoking questions. And there are a lot of uh, you in this group who have been curious, who are who care about what's happening. So let's keep that spirit going because after a time we all get fatigued. This war has been going for more than two months, but let's keep that spirit going until justice has been served. So with that, thank you so much. Have a good night.